Does your commuter rail system have one line, that one line that just stands out from the rest of the system for one reason or another? Whether it be due to short lengths, low ridership, odd placement, or just straight up different. Well, I'm here to point out this line, go over its history, explain why it's so odd, and what can be done to fix it. All of this and more in this episode of Fixing Your Branch Line. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Fixing Your Branch Line, the series where I casually call out a branch line for being somewhat different, go over its history and flaws, and suggest what could be done to fix it. Although the series has been traveling south from my home railroad, one would think that Mark is the next railroad to be reviewed. However, the Frederick branch is too short to be considered a fourth line, and it's pretty much integrated into the Brunswick line, so Mark is therefore DISQUALIFIED from the series. Interestingly enough, I also considered the Hershey line as part of the Havana Suburban Railway since it's the next commuter railroad with more than four branch lines heading south, but this branch seems to be part of the National Railroad instead of a commuter railroad, that and it appears to be way too hard to track on Google Maps to make proper judgments, so therefore this railroad is also DISQUALIFIED from an episode in the series. Therefore, we're shipping up to Boston where we'll be reviewing the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, also known as the MBTA. Just like the last two railroads in this series, this agency also operates other forms of public transit in the greater metropolitan region, including streetcars, subways, buses, boats, and of course, commuter rail. This agency's commuter operations are split into two divisions, the south side lines made up of ex-New Haven lines, and the north side lines made up of ex-Boston and Maine lines. There's also an ex-Boston and Albany slash New York Central line to Worcester, but that one starts from South Station so it's also integrated into the south side and likely won't get a heritage unit commemorating its original owner. So. After much consideration through MBTA's expansive system and history with rather peculiar branch lines, I made the tough decision to choose the Needham Branch. Technically, this line is not the shortest, nor does it have the lowest ridership or the lowest number of stations, but I decided to choose it because its present day alignment is comprised of a branch line, an inner city line, and a connector, all adding up to a commuter rail line that's shorter than nearby light rail lines and geographically U turns towards its terminus ignoring the memo from Boston who told them don't look back. Since this branch is made up of various routes, its history is rather complicated, but I'll try my best to explain it and keep it simple. So let's begin our look into the oddly rooted Needham line. Just to make this branch all the more weirder, the first incarnation of the present day branch dates all the way back to 1834 where Boston's first railroad, the Boston and Providence, completed their main line between their namesake cities via Tollgate, present-day Forest Hills, named after where the railroad passed the Norfolk and Bristol Turnpike, later Washington Street, at one of its toll gates. However, the real story of this branch doesn't start for another 16 years, when the railroad opened the branch to Dedham through West Roxbury on June 3, 1850. Not too far away was the Charles River Railroad, who extended its main line from Boston Back Bay to Needham in 1860 in order to transport gravel to fill in the Back Bay, with the line being extended to Medway the next year, and then to Woonsocket, Rhode Island to connect with the Providence of Worcester. Eventually, the section between Newton Heights and Brookline was sold to the Boston and Albany Railroad in 1883, with a connection from Newton to their main line at Riverside being built a few years later, while the New Haven Railroad also built their cutoff from Needham Junction to West Roxbury as a faster alignment to Boston and a rather difficult engineering project involving cutting through some pretty tough rocks. Interestingly enough, the New Haven and Boston and Albany did run a jointly operated loop service from Boston to Needham via the cutoff and Highland Branch from 1911 to 1914, but after that, most Needham trains to Boston originated at Needham Heights or Newton Highlands, with service between these two very close stations existing for some reason until 1927, while service on the original segment to Dedham from West Roxbury ended in 1940. At the same time, Service on the adjacent Charles River Railroad, now part of the New Haven, was cut back to West Medway from Woonsocket, and later Millis in 1966, as service was eventually reduced to an RDC shuttle that would be attached to the back of a Needham Branch train, until service on the Millis Branch was discontinued the next year. Meanwhile, Boston was looking to replace their aging elevated metro lines with subways, with the original proposal for the Orange Line to run past Forest Hills and up to Needham Heights, but the city only had enough funding to run the subway to Forest Hills, as commuter service to Needham continued as the MBTA purchased trackage from Penn Central, the New Haven successor, in 1973. The line was temporarily shut down from 1979 to 1987 to accommodate construction of the Orange Line subway to terminate at Forest Hills, which was also where this branch splits from the New Haven main line. After that, 
things really haven't changed all that much for the local hall commuter service, as it still serves the same station since its construction in the mid-1800s, albeit with some renaming, while there is currently no service south of Needham Junction or a connection to the Highland Branch, presently the D branch of the Green Line Light Rail. Speaking of Light Rail and the Highland Branch, there was also a 1945 proposal for the MTA, predecessor to the MBTA, to also extend Light Rail service to Needham Junction where we meet with the New Haven, but this plan was also never fulfilled for reasons unknown. Maybe it was seen as a plan that'll never be. First of all, as a branch line that runs along the Northeast Corridor, I would like to suggest for the line to have a force track added on its side, but this doesn't seem too viable due to the tracks being trenched, making it rather difficult to adjust the existing alignment. After diverging from the Northeast Corridor, the line starts off promising with two tracks, but then converges to one just before Rosslindale Village. The ultimate determinator just after the station looks a bit iffy since its current base seems to be lower and newly built right in the middle of where the two tracks used to be. Afterwards, the rest of the line is single tracks with a room for a second track just south of the existing track, but many of the bridge is still holding a double tracked right of way, and the only limiting bridge with a single track was built in response to I-95 in the 50s. Otherwise, Props to this line for being entirely grade separated up until Needham Junction, which is the region where this branch becomes really weird, and showcases reasons as to why I decided to choose this branch to review. Instead of heading down southwest towards Millis, the line makes a sharp 90 degree turn towards Needham, runs single track and supposedly a double track right of way, with the exception of two signs just before Needham Heights, and then slowly becomes more abandoned and less maintained heading northeast just before being plowed by a one more lane bro highway expansion of I-95, and then gets rail trailed by the Upper Falls Greenway all the way to Newton Highlands, where the rest of the line is taken over by the Green Line D Bridge. Yikes, that is one intense route conversion. Despite its odd routing and relatively short length, frequencies are somewhat decent with hourly service, so I'll give this branch a 7 out of 10. Consists are essentially the same as the rest of the system, which comprises of an unpredictable variety of both single level and bi level coaches, and is one of two rares to operate both kinds interchangeably. So I really don't have too much to say in regards to that, other than they do a good job carrying the passengers to this line. So with this odd rooting from Boston making a sharp turn to Needham being a surprisingly common rooting for over a century, how would I change this branch line for the better? Let's just say I have more than a feeling that this can work. Despite the short and quite honestly odd rooting of this branch line, there surprisingly haven't been that many proposals to adjust the current service. Of course, there was the initial plan for the Orange Line to essentially replace its branch by running all the way to Needham instead of Forest Hills, but I'm honestly glad this plan didn't happen, since it would essentially do what Patco did to the Camden and Atlantic alignment, in which the original heavy rail alignment to a larger city is blocked by a metro. So considering the fact that no major right-of-way realignments are necessary for the Needham Line, and that most of the original right-of-way to Woonsocket is still somewhat intact, I'd like to bring light upon the intended service that ran west of Needham. Likewise, my official antidote for this branch line would be... Return to Bellingham and Light Rail to Needham Junction. If I had the nickel for every time a previous rail proposal I didn't know about resulted in an anticlimactic official antidote, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened two episodes in a row. But back to the part that wasn't partially spoiled earlier in the episode. Even though one could argue that such services are redundant, Parallel passenger rail lines are actually beneficial in this case, since it not only gives people closer stations to commute to, but it likewise increases frequencies in the greater region, and could also relieve congestion on one line. I choose Bellingham as the terminus of this plan in particular, since it's where this restored branch line would meet with an extended Franklin line, since its current alignment continues along the Grafton and Upton right-of-way instead of ending at Blackstone on a different alignment. The rest of the line to Needham is mostly intact, albeit with some crafty curves through a wall of houses just north of the proposed station, with some sections being double-tracked where necessary to keep a good balance of traffic flow. Basically, I'm suggesting to make the Franklin Line, or this Bellingham Line, the Fairmount Line for the Providence Line, in which the two parallel lines serve multiple communities in between their two identical termini, and both of these lines can meet at a switch station of some sort, which could also result in loop service where using the train set on one of the two lines after finishing a run on the other. Service can also extend south to Bellingham to reach Blackstone or Woonsocket, and could even continue to or connect with a Worcester to Providence service if need be. Meanwhile, the rest of the Needham line that diverges from the cutoff can be converted into a brand new light rail line, or simply another branch of the D line, 
so this way the town can have frequent and direct access to both commuter and light rail. I know this idea was technically shown earlier in the episode, and I didn't find out about it until I was almost done writing the script, but it's nice to know that others have thought of these same ideas before. Following both of these alignments can therefore bring forth new commuting opportunities for two heavily utilized sectors in the MBTA and connect the lower regions of the state all the more closer to Boston on a frequent basis, thus giving these residents peace of mind. As much as I wanted to cover the Greenbush line due to its short length, low ridership, and recent completion with track spacing flaws, I eventually decided it wouldn't be fair to review a branch line that's currently part of a larger project the restoring service on the old colony lines. And there wouldn't be too much to say about this branch other than insert second track here and return to Plymouth and merge with the Kingston line. Furthermore, I decided to continue the same trend from the previous railroad, in which I review a branch from the other predominant predecessor railroad, and since all the old colony lines were once part of New Haven, this episode's honorable mention will be going to a former Boston and Maine route. And despite their longer lengths and equally decent quality, I ultimately decided to choose the Newburyport line. This branch is usually associated with the Rockport line, but I specifically decided to focus on the Newburyport line for this episode since it used to run the Portsmouth and Dover, New Hampshire, but it's since been cut back to its current terminus. The original line opened not too long after the first segment of this episode's feature branch line, in which the simply named Eastern Railroad commenced service between Portsmouth, New Hampshire and East Boston Terminal in 1836, with passengers being ferried over to Boston until being connected via rail bridge in 1849. A few years earlier in 1842, the Eastern Railroad worked with the Boston and Maine to connect at Dover and share main lines to Portland, Maine, as the two railroads also competed against each other with their own respective branch lines south to Portsmouth, with the B&M having the present-day Haverhill line. That is, until the B&M ended the competition by leasing the Eastern in 1884 and integrated it as their Eastern route. In addition to Rockport, the route also had branches to Saugus, Marblehead, Essex, and Emmisbury, Massachusetts, but these lines weren't as popular and didn't last as long as the Gloucester or Rockport branch. Eventually, all passenger service on the Boston and Maine was reduced to small consists of Bud RDCs, which is pretty fitting considering the B&M was the largest user of RDCs with 109 on the roster, as these RDCs helped keep service running through 1966 when the MBTA took over commuter service in the greater Boston region. Service was eventually cut back to Ipswich in 1976, with a two-stop extension back to Newburyport opening in 1998 with the line still being single-tracked almost immediately after splitting from the Rockport line at Beverly. As of the making of this video, there are currently plans to electrify parts of the MBTA, with the only branch to surprisingly be electrified from North Station being right up to Beverly, where the Newburyport branch splits from the Rockland branch. From here, the line will use battery electric multiple units, in which they are technically powered by batteries that are recharged by overhead wires, which led me to ask why not extend the wires all the way to begin with, but that's a topic all on its own. So given the double-tracked mainline to Beverly, proposed electrification, and highest ridership in the entire north side, why did the Newburyport branch get the honorable mention? Well, at least when compared to the other remaining branches that start at North Station, the Newburyport line is historically the most overlooked branch in terms of expansion. Even if these expansion projects aren't specifically operated by MBTA, their lines are still good enough to cooperate with future inner-city rail lines, and they all were part of major mainlines of the Boston and Maine. The Fitchburg line was part of the B&M's Boston Detroit main line and is planned to see service restored to the state border at North Adams. The Lowell line was part of the B&M's Boston to Montreal main line by transferring service at Wells Falls and White River Junction, Vermont, with multiple discussions to bring Amtrak service on the line to Concord, New Hampshire. And the Haverhill line was part of the B&M's western route to Portland, Maine, and currently sees service from Amtrak's surprisingly frequent downeaster. Meanwhile, the Newburyport line is overlooked for long-term expansion and only gets an extension two stops back to Newburyport from Ipswich instead of continuing into New Hampshire and connecting with Amtrak at Dover via Portsmouth. Although, this task involves a monumental challenge in itself, running trains through New Hampshire, a state that continuously fought against multiple passenger rail projects by both Amtrak and MBTA in favor of roads, even as recently as December of 2022, when their state legislature canceled all funding for passenger rail projects in the state, citing low ridership and higher taxes. Now, Florida claimed the exact same thing to defund the state-funded passenger rail project, but they said yes to Brightline since they primarily utilize private investment instead of taxpayer dollars, so if that works in Florida, it can definitely work in anti-rail states like New Hampshire. So I think it's time we have Brightline New England as the official antidote for this branch, but I digress. Despite all the opposition and underrated status of the Newburyport branch, 
I still stand by an official antidote for this branch to return to Dover via Portsmouth. So this way it can provide better connections to Amtrak service. I know that reintroducing rail service to a region that hasn't seen any in decades is a difficult task since the people there are used to a car-based society, but I still suggest the restoration of service for not only this line, but for countless other passenger rail routes across the country, in order to develop a stronger web of traveling opportunities. One of the many purposes of this channel, and specifically this series, is to raise awareness of various ways to enhance passenger rail in a specific area through methods that may have not been considered before, and so that more people are familiar with and support rail transit in their region and across this vast nation. No matter how long it takes for some reasons to become more rail friendly, I still make these videos in hopes that transit enthusiasts and politicians alike can listen to these suggestions and realize the benefits of rail transit over roads so that these simple ideas can eventually become reality. Thank you all for watching this episode of Fixing Your Branch Line. Of the five commuter railroads I've covered so far, I've definitely had the hardest time choosing a branch line for the MBTA, since even though some lines are rather short, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad or need to be fixed. All of these lines have unique histories, great constants, and decent frequencies, and despite complaints from commuters and politicians, it's really hard to hate on the MBTA's commuter operations, since all of their lines have their own little perks. But at the end of the day, I ultimately decided to review the Needham line based on what happened to it over the years, and to showcase how a simple realignment could expand both commuter and light rail service to regions that haven't seen any in decades. Thank you again for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe for more. Have a good day.